So a bit about me, I've been working with databases from Oracle to Microsoft to MySQL to Postgres uh, for the past 20 plus years. And this presentation is meant to be a presentation uh, for programmers, mostly beginner programmers, junior programmers. The idea is to give some intuition as to what PG is and a little bit about how it works so you understand some concepts. So let's get to it. So today I'll talk a little bit about this lecture series, a quick introduction to relational databases, another introduction to the Postgres database. I'll give you an example of MVCC in action in Postgres, a little bit about Postgres tools, and at the end, an example of database consistency and a live coding of isolation and an example of a deadlock. So in general, uh, this presentation, like I said, it's for curious beginners. If you have never used Postgres, you're not gonna enjoy yourself. If you're a database expert and you're gonna correct me on every little thing, you're still not gonna enjoy yourself. If you have lots of experience with databases, <clears throat> you're not gonna have a good time. Uh, if you absolutely love NoSQL and you definitely hate SQL because you like to hate certain things and love others, uh, then you're not going to have a good time. So this presentation, I typically give to startups and mid-sized companies that use Postgres, possibly in addition to other tools. And they wanted to, the juniors to have some idea of Postgres, how it works, how databases work, and to see Postgres in action. And because typically junior programmers are a bit averse of databases, they don't really understand how they function, they see them as black boxes, um, and so they're afraid. So the idea here is to try to engage you with the database, uh, to have you understand where it comes from, how it works, what it does. So maybe you'll realize it's here to help you. Uh, there are three other parts that I present. These are all free presentations. Um, feel free to reach out if you would like one. Uh, the advanced ones are more about optimization. I saw that back in September, there was a presentation about indexes. So it's Stuff like that. So without further ado, let's ask the very simple question, what is a database? If you Google database, uh, you'll get some nice academic answer. In my opinion, a database is just a place where you put data and it's much better if you can get it back. If you really want to dive into database at a more academic and technical level, I highly recommend redbook.io which is the website for the red book, or the classic red book about databases. Um, I myself am not, I would say an academic database expert. I don't write databases. I've never written a database. I just have lots of experience working with developers and databases. So let's try to build our own database. And let's start from this amazing database that has basically two functions and it's defined in bash. First, We'll define a set function that accepts some key and value. Uh, second, you can give it a key and it returns the last example of this key in the file, uh, its, its value. Now, clearly this is not a very good database. What do you guys think is the problem with this database? Can you give me examples? Feel free to talk by the way. No, nope. okay. So uh, I, I, I don't even know Bash good enough to understand <laughs> how to use a database. That said that uh, for, for starters, uh, if one of the values is comma, you're as well. Uh, yes, uh, let's, let's uh, assume that. Retrieval, yeah. uh, querying, indexing, whatever. The retrieval from the, it's good for write only, for reading and processing, it's uh, very bad unless you use awk, so it's somehow. <laughs> Okay, so yes, everything you said is true. Uh, there are a number of other problems. Well, first of all, I'm not sure how well this will do if you have multiple readers and multiple writers, um, but I can think of two very serious problems. If we took this seriously, the first problem is that the database just grows and grows and grows, right? There's nothing cleaning up old values. So that's clearly not a very good idea. The second issue is what if we wanted to use this to store, say, the balance of, uh, of accounts in a bank, right? 
let's say there's a single writer, single reader, we don't have to worry about locks. Uh, we can't do an atomic transaction. The simplest example is, let's say we have two accounts, um, an account on my name, an account on Mayo's name, we each have $10, and I want to transfer $5 from my account to Mayo's account. Uh, one of the problems here is that we can't do this in one shot. We have to do two operations. And something can happen in between those operations. And this is, of course, a problem. So the idea here is to explain that it seems easy to build a database, but there are actually a lot of questions that we don't really think about. And so we're going to build on this example and eventually show you that Postgres isn't that far from this very simple idea. So as programmers, I would encourage you and anybody watching this on YouTube to pause the video and think to yourself, how would you build a database? And let me put this to you. You have a number of use cases. Maybe banks want to use you. Maybe Circum and Orange want to use you to store their prepaid. So they have thousands of transactions, maybe tens of thousands of transactions per second at the height of the day. At the same time, Facebook and Google maybe want to use you. Of course, this is ridiculous, but I'm just giving an example. You also want to have a database that's for operational uses. So you want to have your master database for your project. And you also want to have it for analysis because you want to query some logs or some data. So these use cases can be translated into specification, right? You can have very small databases, very large databases, like over a petabyte. You can have different types of data, like tables and graphs. You can have uh, different, uh, different uh, access loads. You can have lots of reads, lots of writes. You can have big transactions, small transactions. You can have various types of guarantees and so on. And let's add to that a whole bunch of technical challenges, right? So you have power outages, you have transactions, you have multiple read and writes, you have versatility. Maybe people want a database that up to a certain point can use the same database for everything. You have maintenance. Some people want to upgrade the database without taking it down. Uh, you have different types of infrastructures. Uh, you can have different uh, chip architectures like ARM and AMD. You can have different uh, operating systems like FreeBSD, Windows, Mac, Linux, Unix, and so on. And all of this, then you still want performance, right? So if you really think about it, building a database is not at all simple. It's a very complex piece of machinery that has lots of specifications and it has to support a wide range of use cases and, uh, and setups that it has to run in. So let's be more specific. Let me ask you this question. How would you solve transactions? Now, of course, we don't have time for a very long debate. So I'm going to propose one way to solve transactions. And when I say solve, I mean how we would write data to disk. Um, this is not the only way to solve transactions. There are many, many ways. In fact, this may be a horrible way to solve transactions. But the way that I'm going to present is to build some intuition as to how Postgres works under the hood. So let's start simple. Let's say we have a single process and thread. We don't have multiple things happening at the same time. We'll create two files, basically a data file, which will store our data, and another file, which we'll call our commit log or commit journal. And it'll work a bit like this. We'll take our previous idea that we wrote in Bash, and we'll add an operation number, and we'll say the following. In order to allow for uh, money to move Wait, uh, I may, I may atomically. Have, I mean, sorry. Yeah, I'm a little confused about what is the problem you're solving. Well, we're trying to solve the problem of having an atomic transaction. So I'm just giving you an example. There are many problems that need to be solved, right? But you want to atomically move data from one key value to another key value in this specific example. Uh, yes, but uh, could you explain to me what's the bad scenario? I mean, what's, what's the scenario that you're well, trying to prevent? I, I'm about to get to that. So let's say we start by adding three accounts, Amir, Tony, and Adi, yes? Now, Adi wants to transfer $5 from her account to my account. Now, without this committed number table, in our previous bash idea, when we have just keys and values, we can't do this in one shot. We can't move money atomically from Adi's account to my account because we have to write changes one by one, right? So. Here's a possible solution. The idea is that every time we want to write data to our file, we'll add some operation number that increments for every operation. Now, remember, we have a single process, single, single thread. 
things are relatively simple. And what we'll say is when we want an operation to be saved or committed in database speak, we'll, we'll require that the number of the operation be added to the committed number table. Once we do this, when we read from our data table, we'll consider the operation number, the highest operation number that is recorded in the committed number table to be the right version. Okay, so we can write operations to this table, but until we save the committed number, that operation isn't considered written yet by the reader. Now, this is a nice little toy example. Of course, this could never scale to a real database, but it's just some idea to give you some intuition as to how Postgres works. Of course, I would challenge you, I would challenge you to stop and think to yourself, how would you add deletes to this setup? How would you add multiple readers, multiple writers, multiple transactions happening at the same time? This is quite a problem. Now, I would also ask you once again, what is the problem with this architecture? What is one problem that you can think of right off the bat? You are writing unneeded values. You have the data Sorry. of Tony, which is the not related. So basically, how do you know how many Tony has? Well, the committed number isn't the only operation that, that we take into account. The committed number is like a high watermark. So anything less than the highest committed number is okay. So maybe the fact that you always have to, for every fetch, you have to check your committed number and filter okay. this table accordingly. Yep, that's one example, definitely. Um, another issue is that, as you can see as before, we just kept, keep adding data to this data file. It just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing, which is not great, right? I mean, space is cheap, but it's not that cheap. And second, we have to think how are we going to delete stuff? So you, you might imagine that we could, uh, maybe for deletions, we could add a bit field or something like that to, to say that some row is uh, from now deleted and so on. But basically, Everything you guys said is pretty much correct, yes? And we'll get back to this when we look at how MVCC works inside Postgres. So now that we've established how uh, one way of creating transactions, let's move on a bit. We'll visit, the, we'll visit this once again when we talk about Postgres and MVCC. So as you've seen, before we look at this uh, slide, there are many ways that we might want to build transactions into a database. So. Perhaps one day your friend comes to you and says, hey, listen, I built this incredible database. It's amazing. It's so fast. It's so good. And then you say to them, okay, well, how do I know that your database is good for me? How do I know that it works? Um, what, what does it mean that a database works? What does it mean that a database is a database? So there's lots of debate about this. Uh, there's, there are many ways to define a database. One way to define a database that the academy, specifically the group of researchers in the, um, in the academic circle uh, decided to define a database is whether or not it adheres to the ACID standard set of guarantees, which means there are certain properties that your database should have. And if you, if your database, if a database uh, if exhibits these properties, you can say it is ACID compliant. And most people would agree, yeah, that's a, a program that I would consider a database. So let's go through the four properties of ACID. The first simple property of ACID, which we have given an example of, is atomicity. We want to be able to tell the database to make changes on multiple rows all at the same time or none of them. You want to make sure that, let's say, your application starts making some changes and then you realize you want to stop making the changes that you can undo without actually having affected rows in the database. Or you can say, Here's a bunch of changes to the database, for example, move money from one account to the other. But if the database crashes while it's applying the changes, then either all of the changes have been applied or none of them have been applied. But you don't have somewhere where you're in the middle. The, the, second, the second attribute I wanna look at is durability. Durability is quite simple, and yet people tend to forget that some databases, <laughs> Mongo, uh, might not save your changes. So for example, 
let's say I want to tell the database here are a bunch of transactions. Here's some money that needs to move. Here's some new users. Here's some new information. If the database tells me it has saved the data, it has said it's committed to the data, I expect that to mean that even if the server the database is on shuts down because of, let's say, a power outage, when I turn it back on, I will still see that data um, as it was committed. So this might seem obvious to anybody working in the database, but this isn't so obvious because up until a few years ago, MongoDB, for example, would not issue what's called an F-sync, meaning after you would commit data to Mongo, it didn't necessarily write its data to a file. So if your, your computer shut down, your MongoDB computer shut down and you start it back up, you might not see uh, written data. Uh, so durability isn't always obvious. By the way, durability is also very, uh, very hard to make sure you're doing right when you have, uh, let's say, a cluster of in-memory systems. Yes, there, there are many cases in which durability seems obvious and yet it might not be. Let's move on. The third uh, guarantee we'll talk about is consistency. This isn't transactional consistency. This isn't eventual consistency. This is consistency in the term of invariance. What is an invariant? Most classically, an invariant would be a constraint like a foreign key. When you design your database, there are certain properties of the data that you want to make sure are never, uh, are never violated. For example, you want to make sure that every time there's a sale in the sales table, there is always an invoice. No matter what the application does, no matter what bugs it has, no matter how the user uses the application, the data must be correct in terms of the business rules. And the business rule is, for example, every sale gets an invoice. Why do we want consistency? Because it's, pro it's possible that there are multiple apps accessing the database. And you need to be able to communicate to an application what it can expect data to look like. And so you want to accept, expect from the database that it will enforce this consistency. Now, this is a general term. Of course, everything has a price. You may decide that even though your database can support consistency, you don't want to use it, but that's more advanced stuff. In general though, for a database to be considered ACID compliant or ACID supporting, it would have to support consistency if the user chose to use it. And the last but not least, and the one that I'll focus on in the latter part of this presentation is isolation. So isolation is a bit tough to uh, wrap your head around. But there is a problem with databases that support multiple uh, users at the same time, which is on the one hand, different connections need to be able to see data as if they're all by themselves. At the same time, you want to make sure that weird stuff doesn't happen. What do I mean by weird stuff? Imagine eBay and imagine two users try to buy the same watch. You don't want to sell the same watch twice. The watch is either sold to one user or the other. At the same time, when the users are looking at the, at the inventory, they still want to be able to see the same watch. And so this is what isolation provides. We will go into isolation a bit more later and I'll even have a live coding example of isolation and the downside of isolation, which is sadly deadlocks. If you've ever hit a deadlock in a database, well, it's not very fun. And we're gonna recreate one live so you can see what it is, why it happens, and we can think of what you might wanna do when you hit a deadlock. So now that we've talked about ACID and the properties of databases or database programs, let's talk about the obvious question in, in my mind, can one database program solve all of your problems? So this is an open question. It isn't entirely clear, but what I can tell you is that there are extreme cases in terms of the uses of a database. So one extreme case is OLTP or transactional processing. What is OLTP or what is an example of OLTP? Imagine if you're a bank and you have to store the accounts of your customers, how would you use that database? You would typically have mostly key-based updates. You would update an account and change its balance. You might have some inserts when customers join, some deletes when customers leave. Occasionally you'll want to read multiple keys. If you have to say, summarize the amount of money a customer has when they have multiple accounts, but typically your database will be relatively small and you'll care very much about ACID. Also typically transactional processing systems are the main core of a product. Some, some uh, let's say a retailer, uh, let's say uh, some Shopify retailer, a database is at the core of the system. 
The same can be said uh, for, let's say, a cellular company's prepaid uh, system. Because at the core, there is a system that must know how much uh, data was paid for for each SIM. Let's look at the other extreme. The other extreme would be OLAP or online analytical processing. For example, BigQuery. In these systems, you typically dump data all the time. You add information, typically information about an event that happened in a business or some metric that you're collecting or something like that. Since you're adding data that's mostly uh, recorded events in real life, you will typically never update it. In other words, you're just dumping in more and more data. And if you do do deletion, you'll most typically have a sliding window, meaning you'll have, let's say, three years worth of sales data or three years worth of metrics, and you'll be deleting information wholesale. So you're gonna say anything over than three years, delete all of it. Also, when you want to query this data, you'll typically be reading large amounts of data. So you're not gonna be asking for one particular row, you'll be asking something larger. For example, if I'm a, a retailer, I'll say, what's the most frequently bought product in my, in my inventory? These databases grow very quickly and can reach terabytes and sometimes petabytes. Most importantly, for these systems, you might not need ASIC. For example, if you're doing queries over a year or two of data, whether or not the last day of data is added might not be that important. So these are two very extreme use cases of databases. So if there are extreme uses of databases, as you might assume, there are different types of databases for different types of data and use cases. The first type of database, which is the type of database we're gonna focus on is relational databases. Uh, these are the MySQL Postgres's of the world. Uh, you typically uh, represent data with tables and columns and rows and define some relationships between them and then you access them with SQL. There are of course other types of data which you might want to use different types of databases for. For example, multi-value databases for XML. If you have documents, you might want to store them in a, sorry, in a key value store, such as uh, MongoDB. And if you have graph data, you might want to store that data in a graph database uh, that can support the types of queries you want to make. We're going to focus only on relational databases. And specifically, we're going to get into only one type of relational database, which is the classic disk-based object relational database. And even more specifically, we're going to talk only about Postgres. That being said, there are what I call the four musketeers, the four main uh, relational databases uh, in the world. Uh, these are Postgres, Oracle, MSSQL, and MySQL. They basically date back to the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s. In these databases, Disk is the main data store. Memory is a cache or a place to do some scrap calculation, uh, lock stuff, uh, do some temporary uh, uh, caches of, of uh, calculated results and so on. For the general case, typically these databases are almost one size fit all. Meaning if you need a database of say one gigabyte and on that database you wanna do both transactions and some analytical queries and whatnot, typically, these databases have everything you need. However, you might need an extreme use case. Let's say you have hundreds of thousands of transactions per second and your database is relatively small, just a few gigabytes. You could use an in-memory database. I'm not gonna get into it too much, but basically in in-memory databases, memory is the main data store, meaning almost always all the information is in memory. The disk is used more as a backup, such that if the machine is blown away, at least you have a copy of the data and you can recreate your memory. These databases are really good for hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, even on a PC, but the limitation is of course memory. Of course, you could buy a system with lots of memory, but that's really, really expensive. On the other extreme, if you have a lot of analysis you wanna do, you could use a column-based database. Um, these databases are again, uh, backed by disk typically, they store data slightly differently from the classic disk-based systems. They're very good for OLAP, but they're not so good for transactions. So I'm just giving you this uh, general view of, of, uh, of the database land. But there are many different databases depending on what you wanna do, but usually for what most people need, uh, one of the four classic databases is more than enough. So 
we've heard about relational databases. How do we use them? I'm almost certain that everyone listening has seen or used or daily uses um, SQL. For people who are new to databases or very new to databases, you typically access a relational database with SQL. So what is SQL? SQL is, first of all, a standardized uh, language that has been standardized since the 1980s. And it allows you to talk to a database or to query a database in a declarative manner, meaning as opposed to writing ex uh, uh, explicit code that's imperative, where you say, if something, do something, else something, and so on. In SQL, you tell the database, this is what I want you to do. You figure out how to do it. Now you might ask, why is there anything to figure out? So let's take an example. Let's say we have two tables, employees and departments, and we want to combine them for the result of all the employees. You want a table of all the employees and the information about the departments um, that they work in. However, we have a machine, our database machine is limited to say 10,000 rows of memory. So we might have three different uh, setups or situations and the database has to figure out what to do. What do I mean by three different situations? The relationship of rows between the employee and department table can vary. Let's look at the first setup. So the first setup, we might have 20,000 employees and just 20 departments, in which case, it's most likely that there's one uh, department per 1,000 employees. In another setup, we might have, for some odd reason, 20,000 employees and 20,000 departments where every employee has a department. And in the, in the third state, we'll have, let's say, 20 employees and 20,000 departments, uh, but only 20 employees actually have a department. So technically, there's a one-to-one -one relationship there, but only for 20 employees and the other 19,000-something departments have no employees. So when the database needs to run the query, it has to decide how's it gonna combine these two tables. Now I'm not gonna get into all the options, but the database has encoded very few algorithms to join tables. What the database has to figure out is for every query, given the structure of the tables it needs to query and the statistics of the data in the tables, how will it query the data in the most effective manner? So we're not gonna get into this because it's out of scope for this uh, presentation, but generally this is what one of the uh, best points of modern databases. You just give it data, you define the queries and it'll automatically figure out how to combine data and how to calculate results to queries without requiring you the programmer to figure out exactly how to do it in the most optimal manner. Inside the database is a program called the optimizer, which will take the query analyze the query together with information it has about the data in the tables, and it will decide which mechanism, which algorithm is the most efficient one for the query and data you've given it. The result of this optimizer is called an explain plan, and we'll take a brief look at an explain plan a bit later on. So now that we've talked about databases in general, let's talk about Postgres specifically. We're going to start with a brief background about Postgres. I'm not gonna read all this. It's a lot of information. You don't have to know all of it. It's not that important. In general, Postgres began slightly after IBM System R. System R was created around the 1970s. Just a bit of history to remind you of where we were in the 1970s. First of all, Bill Gates was born in 1975, so there was no Microsoft. Intel was still a startup. The idea of the x86 was still in design. Memory cost hundreds of thousands of dollars per megabyte. At the end of the decade, it was tens of thousands of megabytes. CPUs were still in the kilohertz to megahertz range, and most systems weren't even 32-bit yet. Also, multi-threading was not invented yet. A little after System R, and a relatively unknown professor called Michael Stonebreaker from University of California, Berkeley, was tasked by DARPA to create a database for their polygon data. Um, around the 1980s, Stonebreaker gathered some of his students, started building Ingress. Over time, Ingress became a product, a commercial product, which was eventually bought. And Ingress served as the basis for many of the products that you know of today. For example, Sybase, Microsoft SQL, and Oracle. However, uh, Stonebreaker wasn't happy with Ingress, and he decided to create a new database based on Ingress and what he's learned from Ingress. And this database is what we now know as Postgres. 
Over time, Postgres, which initially did not support SQL, had SQL added to it somewhere in the 90s. And that resulted in what we now know as the modern PostgreSQL. So modern Postgres, as you all know, we're now in 2022. Postgres's most stable version is 14. It is used by thousands of organizations all over the world with databases ranging from megabytes to petabytes and everything in between. It supports ACID, of course. It has full MVCC. It can compile queries so they run quickly. It conforms to the most uh, modern standards, offers lots of uh, functionality and has uh, a vibrant community full of, of plugins. And to my, in my eyes, the most beautiful thing about Postgres is that it's completely, totally, and honestly free. It's so free that if you take pieces of it and build your own database, you don't owe anybody anything. If you take Postgres and package it and sell to someone, it's still free. If you build a product and you put Postgres inside your product and then sell your product, you still don't owe anybody money. Uh, it's one of the only databases that has such a, uh, such a free license. <clears throat> Sorry. Of course, uh, as you know, Postgres is supported by many companies worldwide and it's actively developed uh, to this day. So, what is Postgres? Of course, Postgres is just a piece of code. If you want to look at the mirror at GitHub, you can see Postgres's code. Um, it's just a program that you have to compile. But what you probably care about is what is Postgres the database? As in, how do I use it to access data and store data? So a Postgres instance is defined by three simultaneous things that have to exist at exactly the same time. There's a directory structure with a bunch of files. There's what's known as shared memory, some memory that's uh, used together by multiple processes and a set of processes that have to be running in order for you to use the database successfully. Every instance has what's known as a so-called database because you can have multiple databases in an instance. Every database must have a schema and all objects in a, in a database must belong to one schema exactly. When you connect to a database, you'll typically have the default schema chosen, which is public. Now for, for programmers, if you're not very familiar with Postgres, you might assume that Postgres has lots of threads and it's really smart and has green threads and stuff. No, it doesn't. Postgres, as I've said, was born in the 1980s. There was no multi-threading. When Postgres was created, there was only forking. So indeed, when you connect to Postgres, every single connection is a forked process. So if you have a thousand connections to Postgres, that's a thousand processes in the operating system. So let's visualize this. A PG instance is a set, as I said, of three things. First, we have our shared memory, which is how our process communicate. The processes in the database do not talk to each other directly ever. When you launch a connection, as I said, the, the main database process called Postmaster will fork off your own private process, which is called uh, just Postgres. And this process will serve you and only you. Of course, on disk, there are a bunch of files. Uh, these are both files for data, files that contain logs and whatever. And the processes uh, communicate with each other through IPC using locks when they want to talk to the file system or when they want to use the file system and they wanna make sure they don't override the same data. So jumping back to our original example, what is MVCC in Postgres? What I want to show you here is that Postgres is not that much smarter than our original idea of how to solve transactions. This is basically the layout of Postgres data on disk. Every row has a kind of offset pointer. It has a transaction ID of the transaction that, edit, that created the row or edited the row or added the, or added the row. It has a bit flag for deleted. It has a bunch of data serialized and it has a few other fields to help with transactions. So how does Postgres work when you actually want to update data in the database? First, one important thing to know, and you should have understood this from the initial idea of that bash script, Postgres cannot actually update data. When you issue an update in Postgres, it is literally uh, mark as delete and insert. There is no update in Postgres. Additionally, when you tell Postgres to delete data, such as this case where I want to tell the Postgres to delete Amir's account of 50 units, all Postgres does is it marks this data as deleted. 
Now, of course, going back to our original idea of how uh, a very simple database might work, there is still the, the glaring issue of a file just growing and growing and growing. And hence, you have to have garbage collection. You need to be able to remove rows that are no longer relevant, that are deleted or are old versions of rows. And this brings us to one of the most painful parts of Postgres, the well-known um, and painful auto vacuum. Auto vacuum is basically Postgres's garbage collection. Every once in a while, depending on how you tune Postgres, Postgres will take a look at the data in the files and try to figure out which, which rows are old rows, rows that have been superseded or deleted and no transaction will want to access. And it'll go through the file and then try to wipe out rows and tell the system, okay, this area is free to use. So if you ever wondered what is auto vacuum and why does it hurt so much? Well, here you go. So let's put this all together. How does Postgres insert data um, from, from start to end? So let's say I issued an insert into the database. Sorry, let's say I, I issue an insert into the accounts table uh, for my name and for, uh, for 100 units. The first thing the database does, it writes the change to what's known as the wall file or, or the, uh, the log of changes. It then remembers in memory that this change has been created. And immediately it tells the operating system, remember to store the, uh, the change to the wall file, this log file of changes to disk, as in don't come back until you've gone to the physical disk and stored the files. At some later point, the application is already doing other things. Postgres will go ahead and actually change the accounts table, the accounts files table, sorry, the accounts tables file to write down that, uh, that the row Amir with 100 has been added. Now you might wonder why this day and age, why do we need to do this? And the reason is because back in the day, remember this is the 1980s, um, hard disks were extremely slow. So it's easier to append to a file rather than to randomly write to a file. And that's what Postgres is optimizing here. So let's move on. How do you access Postgres? Uh, the most commonly known tool and the simplest tool to install is uh, PSQL. It's a CLI tool. Um, it's very useful. You can just run queries. You can figure out uh, what's in your database. Uh, you can look at special database tables and whatnot, and you can run special management commands. What I use it for, what many people use it for, is for explain. You want to ask the database, okay, given a query, how have you decided to run my query? And this might be an example of a result of such a query. So I have a little table, I run a, a count, and I prefix my query with explain, and I get the results from the database saying, this is how I plan on executing your query. Now, query plans and the optimizer are a bit out of scope for this presentation. Um, I do have another presentation in which I talk about this, but in general, PSQL is a tool with which you can simply uh, uh, talk to the database and get some operations done. Of course, there are many other tools. You can use, for example, PG Admin for interactive querying. This is again, just one of many tools uh, that can graphically, that can, show, that can let you access the database uh, graphically. Um, just another way of accessing Postgres. And if you want to see how tables are connected, you might want to use an ERD visual, visualization tool such as PG Modeler. Once again, there are many programs that can do ERD visualization. This is just one of them. But the, the concept I'm trying to, uh, to explain is that there are many ways to access post, the information in Postgres, and you might want to visualize the information in different ways. You might care more about queries, you might care more about table structure, and so on. So now we had a very quick, a very quick crash course of Postgres. What I wanted to get to is consistency and isolation or at least examples of consistency and isolation. For beginner programmers, they might not, uh, you might not understand why you need Postgres. So let's try and show you why Postgres is good for you and why it tries to help you. So let's start with consistency because that's relatively simple. Let's say we have two tables. We have departments and employees. Now the organization, uh, the, the business, the company, whatever says, no matter what happens, there can't be an employee that's just floating. 
every employee belongs to some department. So when, when you design your database tables and you design your database schema, you'll tell it, okay, I want you to add something called a constraint that enforces the following rule. Every time I add a user to employees, validate, make sure that the department ID I've used exists in the department's table. Once you've done this in the database, if the application tries to add information to the employee's table with a department ID that doesn't exist, the database will kick them out and say, nope, sorry, can't do that. So me as the operator of the system, of the database, I know that no matter what bugs or no matter what the application tries to do, the database will always have a certain structure. And this is what enforces that structure. So let's move on to the most interesting part in my eyes uh, for people that are first time using a database. There is the, the, the ultimate question, what is a deadlock and what is isolation? So let's ask, uh, first of all, deadlocks are something that happens generally in concurrent systems. This isn't a special issue with databases. In databases, uh, a, a database deadlock happens when two or more queries try to mutually exclusive lock each other out. What does that mean? Let's take a standard example. Let's say I have two customers in a bank and they're each trying to move money from one another. Customer A is trying to move money to customer B and customer B is trying to move money to customer A. There could be a problem depending on timing. Imagine if they're doing this at exactly the same time. So customer A issues the order to move money from their account to customer B. The database will first extract money from A's bank account by decrementing the balance, lock the A A's account, and then try to move money to B's account. Simultaneously, uh, the transaction for customer B will try to do the same thing. If the timing is just right, they will lock each other out. So let's visualize this. Let's say there are two accounts in the bank and two things are happening at the same time. Customer A, logs on, starts their transaction process. So the database goes ahead, extracts $5 from Amir's account. But at the same time, Matan logged in and Matan also applies his uh, request for a transaction. So Matan's uh, computer or Matan's, let's say the computer servicing Matan's request will begin the same process in reverse. So Matan's transaction locks his account. Meanwhile, the, uh, the transaction servicing my request will lock Matan's account. And shortly thereafter, Matan's transaction will attempt to lock my account. And this results in what's known as a deadlock. Now, this is a very unfortunate, uh, for, sorry, unfortunate situation to be in because you might ask the question, well, who's in charge when this situation happens? The application doesn't necessarily know this is happening. In fact, there may be different types of applications accessing the database. The database is doing exactly what you told it to do. It's trying to, to complete your request. So the interesting question is, what will actually happen in this scenario? And that's exactly what we're gonna, have, we're gonna make happen live. So let's create a deadlock. Dun, 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 live coding. So let's say we have a database. And let's create an account table. Let's add some info to our account table and look at our data. So we now have two connections. And they each see our bank's data. So let's start with some simple stuff uh, to demonstrate isolation. So on the left side, we're gonna start a transaction and we're gonna start making some changes. We're gonna take $5 out of Adi's account, but we're not done yet. We're in the middle of work. Meanwhile, on the right side, we're gonna query the table. So what do you think is gonna happen? What's the result gonna be? All right, let's just run it. So this is isolation. What we can see here is that while the left side is busy 
creating a transaction, it hasn't finished it yet. So even though on the left side, I've taken supposedly money out of Adi's account, I haven't committed my transaction. So what I see is the database in its original state. Let's continue the transaction and place that money in Amir's account. Notice I haven't committed yet. Could so you, of course, could you, uh, Amir, could you run a select on the left side as well? Yes, definitely. So what's interesting is that the left side sees a consistent view of the data. From the left side's point of view, it's isolated. It acts as if it's in its own little world. Even though to the outside world, this hasn't happened yet. It is only when I issue a commit on the left side that the right side sees this applied. But of course, this can create an interesting lockup situation. So let's create a deadlock. Once again, we start a transaction. Wait, let me... Let's start again. Both sides see a consistent view of the database, right? Let's start a transaction on the right and on the left. Sorry, on the left and on the right. So on the left, we're going to, again, try to take some money out of Adi's account. Ah, but simultaneously, Amir also tries to move money out of his account. Up to now, right? If I look at the accounts table on the right, I see the changes of the right side. And on the left, I see the changes of the left side. They don't know that each other is happening. They're isolated. That's what isolation means. They both live in their own little worlds. But at some point, this concept breaks because what happens when I try to complete the transaction? I'm gonna to try to add that money. Ah, the left side is stuck. Why is it stuck? I'll tell you why it's stuck because there's a lock. The right side has locked ID one. This update has created a lock. And so the isolation is broken because suddenly the left side is no longer split brain. Its interactions are tied to the right side. So for example, maybe on the right side, I say, oh, you know what? I, I don't wanna give them money. I'm gonna roll back. Now that I've rolled it back, the left side can continue. And indeed, once I commit, notes, note that since I've rolled back, the left side has not committed. And so I see the database as it was when we all started. Now that I commit on the left, finally, the right side sees it. But let's try a different course of action. Once again, both databases see, both sides see the same database. There isn't really much isolation going on here, right? Let's try this again. This time, we're gonna do something a little bit different. Left side is gonna take some $5 out of Adi's account. The right side is gonna take $5 out of Amil's account. And the left side is once again going to try to deposit the, the money into Amil's account and it's stuck once again. This time the right side doesn't back away. The right side wants to complete the transaction. Now, before I hit enter, what do you think will happen? I think both of them are going to get an error. Okay. Anyone else? It will be stuck too. Okay. Anybody else? It will be Is stuck and then the database will release it as a with an error. A deadlock. Okay. Ready? Note what happened. Everyone was right and wrong at the same time. At first, they're both stuck, but the database is smart. The database can automatically recognize, sorry, that there's a deadlock. And so what does the database do? It arbitrarily chooses one transaction to let it move forward. And the other transaction has an error. Note, the transaction with the error can't do anything. If I try to do another update, it'll say, nope, I can't let you do anything. You can't trust anything in this transaction. You have to roll back, acknowledge that you, you realize that something has happened, 
And when you're done rolling back, I'll let you continue. And so the left side, note it has not committed yet. The right side has nothing you can do. It must roll back. I'm pretty sure that even selects might not even work well. Yep, even selects don't work well. It can't do anything. From the database's point of view, this connection is blocked. You can't do anything. Okay, so I roll back all my changes and now I can work again. Note that the change from the left has not yet taken place. And it's only when I commit that the right side sees the change. And so what is the purpose of this, uh, of this, of this part of the presentation? For beginner programmers, what I'm trying to show you is that, first of all, the database is here to help you. The database is not like a, 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 a black hole of, of stuff that you just throw stuff into. And then occasionally the database will scream at you for no good reason. The database is here to help you and to help the business. Uh, in the case of isolation, it really helps you because it allows you to develop your programs as if they live in their own little world when they're querying the database. However, occasionally that, that, uh, 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 that concept, this isolation that it pretends to, be, to, to give you can break, but it breaks for a good reason. It breaks because under the hood at the end of the day, you can't change two things at once. And so this is what, uh, this is what the purpose of this presentation is. It's to show you as a beginner programmer that first of all, what's a database, what's Postgres, and an example of how Postgres works in the real world and how, how it can save you from hurting yourself. So with that being said, I have my shameless plug. Um, uh, Vicario, the company that I started, has a product called DubHub. DubHub lets you get local copies of uh, databases in the cloud. It will remove uh, sensitive information as it does so. And when you're working locally, you just need Docker to fire up a copy of your database. And with that being said, thanks for listening. Thanks for hearing about Postgres. There's three more presentations if you want. And uh, it's pretty late, so have a good day. Awesome. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> uh, does anyone have questions? Okay, great. Uh, I really enjoyed that talk. Yeah, that was very good. Bye. 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 אם יש לך שאלות בעברית, אם יש לך שאלות בעברית, בעיה שתדבר באנגלית, מוזמן לשאול בעברית גם. כן, תרגישו חופשי. האמת, אתה יכול לספר קצת עוד על החברה שיש לך? כן, אני אשמח. אגב, אם אתה מחפש אנשים, זה גם... יכול להיות שיש אנשים שיטענו את זה. אני מאוד מחפש אנשים, אבל אף אחד לא רוצה לעבוד בחינם, ואין לי כסף. אז אני לא מכיר אף אחד שאוהב לעבוד סתם בשביל הכיף, אבל ברגע שנגייס כסף, אכן אנחנו נחפש אנשים. קורא, אני מבין. אז קצת על החברה, מה שאנחנו עושים, אתם יכולים לפתוח דאב הביו ולפתוח את הדוקומנטציה. אנחנו uh, בעצם מקלים על תהליך הפיתוח, uh, מי מאיתנו לא סבל מזה שיש דאטה בייס בענן uh, שהוא רוצה העתק ממנו, אז אנחנו פותרים את הבעיה הזו ומאפשרים להוריד העתק בדוקר, uh, כולל עדכונים בקנות. רגע, מי צריך להתעצמו על מיוט? עוד פעם? מי מדבר בטלפון ברקע וצריך להתעצמו על עצמו על מיוט? אה, קול. קול. טוב, תודה רבה על ההרצאה, היה מאוד כיף. תודה לכל מי שהגיע. יש לי שאלה קטנה אליך. אם יצא לך לעבוד במוד של קלאסטר, ובארכיטקטורה שהצגת, איך של פוסטגרס עובד, 
הוא עובד בעצם כמו רוב ה... המנועים ה-NoSQLים שהם תומכים בסקייל, ובסופו של יום, איך הוא באמת מתמודד כשיש לו שאילתה שהוא עושה, שאם הוא לא הוריד את הטרנזקציה עדיין לג'ורנל, או מבחינת קונסיסטנסי, כשהוא עושה קווירי מסוים, האם יש הגדרה גם לפוסטגרס, לך ותתשה לי איקס נודים ותביא לי את התשובה, כי אז גם אם הוא אסיד, אז הוא אסיד פר... נוד ולא פר הקלאסטר, אם הוא עובד בארכיטקטורה שאתה הצגת. אז כמה דברים. אחד, בוודאות, אני שומע את עצמי די אקו אגב. למה זה? נראה לי שמחובר פעמיים גם. כן, מחובר פעמיים, אבל רק... טוב, פתרתי את זה. סליחה. תודה. אז קודם כל, פוסטגרס ונילה, כלומר פוסטגרס רגיש, תנוי מהאינטרנט, נכון, מה שאתה אומר הוא נכון, פוסטגרס לא בנוי לעבוד בקלאסטר, אין לו דרך לעבוד בצורה חכמה ולתשאל נודים שונים, הוא, הוא לא בנוי לעבוד בקלאסטר. All that being said, יש אין ספור חברות ומוצרים ופרויקטי אופן סורס שמנסים לפתור את בדיוק הבעיה הזו, יש אני בטוח לא מעט אנשים פה בקבוצה שעשו כזה דבר או ניסו לעשות כזה דבר, ויש מגוון אדיר של פתרונות, מה שנקרא כחול בים, כן? יש לא מעט פתרונות לבעיה הזו. That being said, כאמור, פוסטרס ונילה באמת לא יכול לעבוד בקלאסטר בצורה שאתה רגיל לעבוד בו נגיד עם key value stores מסוימים, נכון. קוראים לזה מולטי מאסטר, הוא לא יודע לעשות מולטי מאסטר. לא, מולטי מאסטר זה כבר, אם הוא עובד... מאסטר סלייב, או יש דאטאבייסים אחרים שעובדים מאסטר מאסטר, זה כבר בתצורה של איך באמת מימשו את זה. ואני כן יודע, כלומר, הוא כן יכול לעבוד בעצם. אתה יכול לעשות לוג'יקל רפליקיישן לנוד שונים. כן, אוקיי, סליחה. אתה יכול לעשות לוג'יקל רפליקיישן לנוד שונים ולתשאל אותם, אבל זה לא דיסטריביות לדאטאבייס. כי בדיסטריביות לדאטאבייס אתה יכול לכתוב לכל... לכל נוט, זה יטופל בהתאם פוסטגרס, ואני לא יודע לעשות את זה. כן, אבל אני לא חושב שיש ארגונים באמת, כלומר אף אחד, אני באמת לא חושב שיש ארגון שבאמת עובד בצורה כזאת עם פוסטגרס, אולי אם מישהו רוצה לקחת אותו ולהתאים אותו לצרכים מאוד מאוד ספציפיים, הרוב זה מוצרים, אתה יודע, ש-on the shelf, RDS או כל... שירות הוסטינג של פוסטגרס, out of the box, משתמש בפיצ'רים האלה וביכולות האלה. עלי בבא פרסם עולה מזמן פורק שלהם שעושה מולטימאסטר בפוסטגרס. אני לא זוכר את השם, אני צריך לחפש את זה. כן, יש פרויקטים. אתה יכול לראות באינטרנט, אם תחפש פוסטגרס מולטימאסטר רייט. אתה תמצא ים פרויקטים, אין, אין אחד שאני אוהב יותר או שאני יכול להגיד שהוא טוב יותר, uh, הבעיה היא באופן כללי שפוסטגרס פשוט לא בנוי לזה, אז כמות השינויים שצריך לעשות בקוד כדי שתוכל לבזר את הפעולה uh, היא, 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 היא די אדירה, uh, זה לא כיף, וזה אז, ומה קורה אם יש לזה גרסה חדשה של פוסטגרס, לך תעשה עכשיו בקפורטים, לך תתאים את כל האקסטנשנים, ו... בעיה, פוסטגרס באופן כללי הוא לא מולטי מאסטר. ועוד טיפ, אם אתה, אם אתה בכל זאת עושה את זה, אל תשתמש בפריימרי גיז מספריים, מראש, אני אומר. מאיר זה, זה אולי מבחינת השארדים, מבחינת איך הוא עושה את הראוטינג, ושוב, כל הפצה יש לה את האלגוריתמיקה שלה. ג'ארדינג זה לא בדיוק דיסטרביוטד. לא, לא, אמרתי ראוטינג, ראוטינג, איך הוא עושה את הראוטינג. איך הוא מחליט איפה לשמור את הדאטה שלך. זה לא סתם שדאטה בייסים כמו מונגו ודברים כאלה לא משתמשים בפריימרי כי שהוא לא מספרי, זה לא במקרה. למונגו יש את האובג'קט ID וזה... אם אתה עושה דיסטריביוטד, אל תעבוד פריימרי כי מספרי. אין בעיה, ועוד שאלה קטנה, מבחינת לוקינג, כן יש אפשרות לקנפג... עוד פעם, לא, לא, לא בפצה ונילה, יכול להיות שיש אבל סוגים שונים של לוקינג שאתה יכול בעצם להגדיר. 
יש איזה קו מנחה, איזה best practice שאתה אומר, אם ואין לך, כלומר, איזשהו, אה, או להגיד על זה אה, כמה, כמה מילים ב, בהקשר הזה של, של הסוגים של הלוקים? אה, יש לי הרבה מה להגיד על סוגים של לוקים, אה, זה פשוט way out of scope של המהפגישה הזו. אה, כן, אה, אני, אני, אולי אין לי טיפים להגיד על, על הסוגי לוקים, כי רוב הלוקים שנתפסים, נתפסים אוטומטית עבור הדאטה בייס. פוסטקאסט באופן כללי יש להם מנטרה של תעשה מה שאתה רוצה לעשות ו... ו... Sorry for the frankness, אבל עזוב טי באמא שלך, כן? כאילו, אל תיכנס ל... ל... איך בדיוק הדיבי עושה מה שהוא עושה. תשלח את ה-SQL, תעשה מה שאתה רוצה לעשות, אני אטפל בכל השאר. זה המנטרה של פוסטקאסט. כל זה לכאורה, כן? בפועל אי אפשר שלא לברוח מכל מיני בעיות. ואני אתן לך דוגמה קלאסית שראיתי כמה פעמים, שיכולה לגרור דדלוק. כשאתה לא חושב שיגרר דדלוק. Uh, נניח שיש לך טבלה של parent ו-child, ויש לך מה שנקרא cascade, כלומר כשאתה עושה delete מה-parent, הוא הולך לטבלה child ומוחק את כל מי שתלוי בו. Uh, עכשיו, בו זמנית יכול להיות שיש לך טרנזקציות על ה-child. מה שקורה במצב הזה, זה שעלול להיווצר מצב שבזמן שטרנזקציה רצה על ה-child, שמוחקת או מעדכנת מספר שורות, בו זמנית באה שאילתה אחרת שמוחקת שורה מהאבא, שבסוף גורר מחיקה מה, מהטבלת בן. עכשיו, על ה-child אין לך שליטה על באיזה סדר הדיליטים או הביטים נעשים, ומהר מאוד אתה יכול להיקלע לדדלו. וזה בכלל לא טריוויאלי להבין שזה המצב, כן? אז צריך מאוד להיזהר כשהפוסטגרס עושה דברים שאתה לא מצפה שהוא יעשה. כי הוא עושה דברים מאחורי הקלעים בלי להגיד לך. אז, אז בזה נתקלתי. לגבי סוגי, לגבי סוגי לוקים, אני יכול לדבר על זה שעות, אבל כבר מאוחר. זה היה <אח> באמת דוגמה טובה, הבאת גם ממש דוגמה טובה פה. <אח> אני, אני אשמח לתת הרצאה על לוקים מתישהו, אבל פשוט היה out of scope. זה היה אמור להיות משהו יחסית פשוט, שמיועד למפתחים מתחילים שרואים את הדאטה בייס כ... משהו אופק כזה, שהם לא מבינים מי זה, מה זה ומה הוא רוצה מהם. 